Um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce Adam Moriarty. He is the Digital Collections Information Manager at Auckland War Memorial Museum. Um, and he has recently worked to release all of the museum's collections online as linked open data. Um, as a colleague of Adam's, I can testify to his excitement and enthusiasm for everything linked open data, and he's excellent to work with. Um, so he recently had a fantastic, the opportunity to have a fantastic opportunity provided by uh, Lianza and the National Library of New Zealand, um, which was to attend uh, the Paul Reynolds Scholarship and Award in honor of the inspira inspirational internet pioneer and media commentator. Um, this scholarship is offered every two years, is worth a minimum of $5,000 and enables the successful applicant to research or develop specialist digital knowledge or experience at an overseas institution. So I'll hand over to Adam. Awesome. Right, kia ora, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming along and linked open data, man. It's pretty sexy. I'm glad you all came in to have a listen. It's a tough sell. Um, as, um, as Claire just said, um, I'm Digital Collection Information Manager at Auckland War Memorial Museum and yep, this year's uh, recipient to the Paul Reynolds Scholarship. So I do, it's already been said, but I do just really wanted to say thank you to Lianza and the National Digital Forum and the Friends of Paul Reynolds uh, for selecting me for this uh, scholarship. Um, I, ne I never worked or met Paul, but my, many of my colleagues did, and it really is uh, a privilege and an honor to have been the recipient of this award. Uh, so yeah, yeah, just thank you for that. Um, just really quickly, what, what I did is I went over to, the, uh, over to the UK to sort of nerd out with some uh, linked data specialists out of the British Museum. But I'll get into that in a second. Um, bit of background about me, why, why did I decide to do this? Well, as, as just mentioned, uh, 12 months ago, at the last NDF, we, we talked about our, our new collections online. So as Digital Information Manager, I look after Collections Online and the team that manages Online Cenotaph. Both of those databases we, we published, refreshed and put online uh, last year uh, and did uh, one million records as linked open data, free, open and downloadable for anyone. And the sort of underp underpinning rule of, of these systems, and a slide I use quite a lot, is that these systems, that they're open, were open as a rule, were closed by exception, and we have one collection, not many. And so for this to work, we needed a technology that allowed us to put all of our stuff out there and make it free and easy to use. And so we decided on linked open data. And you can go and grab all of our stuff from api.aucklandmuseum.com. I promise that's the last uh, plug for, for this piece of work I'll do. Um, for those who are confused and, and say, what is linked open data? You, you're in this session, it's too embarrassing to leave now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, just boiling it down, I tried, it's really hard it's, to get the elevator pitch for this, it's really hard. Uh, but really, it's just about making the connections between our different shared cultural collections that are in institutions. It's about making the connections between all the things that we hold. And ultimately, it's about enabling large scale research and collaboration and aggregation of all of these uh, different data sets. Again, that's still quite wordy, so I tried to boil it down again. Um, and basically, it's just about putting your stuff online in a standard open format. It really is that simple. And you do this through four simple rules. And these are quite, these are well-known rules. These are the, the rules of linked data. Um, everything has a unique identifier, uh, a unique resource identifier, URI. Uh, and you do that for everything. Um, with those URIs, you're going to want to put them online, uh, as HTTP, so that people can then go to them and find out more information about your resource. And again, use some standards so when they go there, they know what they're looking at. And uh, it's the, right at the front of that thing, it linked open data, let's include some links to other things. Let's make this useful by connecting out. And if you're talking about linked open data, you're morally obligated to have a diagram like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what, yeah, it's just, I know it comes in the pack when you sign up. <laughs> Um, and really, it's about the idea that something like the, the cloak, uh, the kiwi cloak in the corner, is related to the ornithological collection with the kiwi, which has, um, was collected by a field collector who was a soldier, and the soldier has the medal in his book. And all of a sudden, we can start making all of these connections between our, our collections um, and start navigating through and finding all these hidden meanings we didn't know about. Um, so that's just a, a, the simplest I could do for linked data. So my trip, 
um, uh, started off with uh, going to the museums and the web conference in LA and uh, again lots of linked data nerds there for me to hang out with including going on a trip to the Getty who have uh, released all of their data uh, from the Getty vocabs uh, in as a format that can be linked and shared. Uh, I then went over to the UK and spent um, most of my time out of uh, a research space project uh, which is based out of the British Museum but also spent the time to go off to the Wellcome Trust British Library Museum of London Tate and Science Museum. Um, I think it's just really worth pointing out just what an amazing sector we work in because every one of the, everyone I met at every one of these institutions was incredibly open, sharing, and it just it reminds me what a yeah what a fantastic sector we work in because everyone was awesome. Um, and I have to admit, writing this presentation was one of the hardest ones I've had to do in in recent times because my first version, which was up until yesterday. Um, was actually just a bunch load of photos of me standing outside um, <laughs> different organisations and shaking hands with people from these places. And it was just going to be holiday snaps for about 20 minutes. <laughs> it got really good because my son, who was six months at the time, came and joined me at the end, so we got really cute. And although it would have been fantastic for me, you guys wouldn't have got anything out of it. Uh, so what I've decided to do is just boil it down to a couple of pieces of software and tools that uh, I got shown and I think really, really helped that first step into, uh, into linked data and a couple of examples um, of some really great, you know, great projects that are doing this and then sort of what I think, what I think the future of this is. Um, and to do that I, I came up with a couple of questions that I was asking people as I went and the first one, yeah, <laughs> is it meant to be this hard? Like it, it, it's really complex, like linked data is, it, it's hard. Um, because you're swapping the way you think. You're going from thinking in tables and rows and columns and cells to all of a sudden you're thinking in a graph database, a network in which everything's interconnected. Uh, it kind of looks like this. Um, I kind of, at the beginning, it was like asking a mathematician to solve a problem by writing a novel because all of a sudden yeah, you're going from these kind of cells to uh, subjects, predicates, and objects, sentences. You're, you're writing a language. You have to take your records and weave them into this language, and it just melts your brain, if you, especially when you think of the number of connections that can be made. And we really struggled uh, to get this and to then explain it to our internal stakeholders and our staff members that why it was important to put all these ridiculous links in because the more links we have the more powerful it is um there were days when we were making these and i just, <laughs> just want to walk out the door but it, so my question is why is it hard does everyone find it this hard or is, am i just like the stupidest person in the room um and then the next question i was asking everyone following up on that is where's the magic like we were all promised if we put our stuff in as linked open data <laughs> like we solve everything like the magic was just going to happen. We were going to, you put your stuff out as a URI, boom, the world's connected. No need to catalogue, don't clean your data, you're going to be fine. You can imagine my current state of disappointment. So, yeah, where's, where is this magic? And, and the third question I was going with is, can dodgy data be linked data? Anyone pretending they don't know what I mean? by dodgy data. I'm talking about the unknown unknown records and the, the duplicates. We have 14 ways of saying Auckland, well we hold on, we had, we've cleaned them up. We have 14 ways of saying Auckland in our database and Parnell was listed as a continent. <laughs> I think it says something about our catalogers. And so we've got all this and we're just, we're publishing it out there as linked data. Is that a problem? And that was sort of the, the question I was going out with. Um, so. Yeah, I got to the, the British Museum and um, met up with the Research Space team. So Research Space is a Mellon funded project. Um, they are the team who have been working to map all three million objects from the British Museum uh, as linked open data. Uh, they're also now working on uh, aggregating so, uh, data from the Rijksmuseum and the Yale Institute of British Art into a combined search that allows you to see those connections and navigate through them. Um, and just some of the Honestly, the, mo the, the most I know, uh, passionate and amazing people working there, and it's like a team of four, which always blows my mind. And then sitting next to them, although I didn't spend too much time with them in the same office, was the Gravitate project, which is looking at using linked data to uh, connect different archaeological resources, so uh, different archaeological assemblages in different museums 
trying to reconnect them, especially if you're talking about one object that's been broken up into multiple pieces and they're scattered around different museums and how it's a really great use, uh, use of, um, of linked data and finding those connections and then bringing them together in a resource that people can use. So went to these guys, said, is it meant to be this difficult? No, um, it's not meant to be this difficult. It's meant to be easy. And so they showed me a tool. First tool and uh, thing, if you're into this, you should go and get. If, has anyone heard of the 3M mapping tool? Yeah, it is new. Um, really horrible link, just Google, you're going to get it. Uh, essentially, what this is, is an online tool um, that allows you to upload an XML from your source system. So for us, Vernon, uh, you upload, and it just provides drop-down mapping guides for you. So, quite simply, we import a primary production place, which is from our Vernon system, and it tells us, well, that, that's probably produced by, and if you're using produced by, you have to use production, and if you're using production, you have to use took place. It sort of walks you through the steps. It builds those relationships for you. It builds the, um, it, it helps you encode the semantic value, and helps you sort of create those, um, those triples, the, the subject, predicates, and objects. And because it's these drop downs kind of update as you're moving, I love them, them, oh, drop down. Um, it sort of guides you and makes sure you can't mess up. You, so make sure your data is meeting the standard. Because I think one of the big problems is this standard is so complex, uh, but we want it every, you want your data to comply. It's very easy to kind of get out of whack and maybe just decide, help, this is too hard. I'll just, we'll skip that step and we'll just do. So this helps ensure that your data is, um, meets the right standard. The other thing it allows you to do, and I haven't got a screenshot because it's really boring, but it helps with that URI generation. So if you don't have a, a way of publishing your data with a unique resource identifier, if you don't have a way of doing that, it helps create them for you and provides the tools to export them online. And actually, I think the, the, best, the, the, I, not the, best, yeah, the best thing about this is it encourages that co collaboration between teams. So you're going to need your IT team to help you with this because mapping, it, you're putting stuff on your website, it's, you're going to need some kind of programmers and developers helping. But then you, uh, the subject matter experts, your curators, collection managers, they have all that knowledge of the mappings. So my role when I was doing this at the Auckland Museum is I was kind of like the translator. Half the time I was speaking to our developers, trying to understand what they wanted, and the other time I was talking to the collection managers and curators, understanding the mappings. And I was trying to sort of translate everyone's needs and hopefully doing a, a, a half-decent job. With a, a t with a tool like this, you allow your collection managers and curators to go in there, do the mappings. They get to stay in their area of expertise. And the system's creating the links, it's creating the, the files and the formats that your development teams can then put online. It's kind of really helping bridge that gap and actually makes it a lot less scary. If, um, if you don't like the 3M tool, you can try the Karma tool. I won't go into this one because it's exactly the same. Um, but maybe slightly nicer interface. Again, it's all about taking the, uh, that really complex mapping and turning it into sort of a workflow that's easy, and in this case, quite visual, because it allows you to see record by record how it's been mapped. And again, it's creating those outward links, uh, outward links for you. Um, one of the best features of uh, the Karma is actually it does have some data cleaning uh, ability in there, and also it helps create links to external sources. Um, but the, the real tool that the sort of, I guess, my big takeaway from the trip, which is a bit of a silly one, really, has anyone here used OpenRefine? Yay. It is, if you haven't used OpenRefine, this is about to rock your world, because it is, honestly, it's awesome. So OpenRefine used to be owned by Google. Uh, they got bored and made it open source. So it used to be called Google Refine. Uh, essentially, you can upload, um, uh, you upload uh, CSVs and Excel files from your uh, source systems and it can do some really really cool sort of cleaning with it. So it's one of those tools we've been using for ages but we'd only ever scratch the surface of, of what it could do. So we used to use it for things like this. You throw in, this is uh, some objects from, you're, you're nodding like you know, <laughs> you've got this from, the, um, you throw in some data from your CSV files or from your source systems and it does some key collision matching and finds all the, the near-miss duplicates. So this is from our Pacific uh, Cultures collection, and it's found five variations of how we describe model canoes. Um, uh, same with ads and hair ornaments. And it allows you to really quickly, you just select the one it's meant to be, and then it cleans up all your data for you, sort of in an automated fashion. Uh, it, a job that would take hours can now be 
done in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, we're currently running through all of our subject, place and person records using this tool to clean up and standardize them. Um, and so that's, we've been using it and this is the only bit we've been using. And while I was overseas, they showed me the, um, the named entity extraction module. Uh, named entity extraction is about going into a free text field, finding uh, key entities such as people, places, names, uh, subjects, extracting that information out and creating links outward uh, to, in this case, DBpedia. This is kind of the magic we were promised um, right at the start. So it, it just requires the right tools to get it working. So in this case, the souvenir program uh, from the Armistice Day, uh, doing 20 years uh, after, the named entity extraction has pulled out the souvenir program as a thing, uh, Armistice Day as a date, the, the play or the concert 20 years after Auckland and Armistice. Each one of those is actually a link to DBpedia, and in DBpedia we then have a link outwards, which we can also, of course, bring the data in and enrich our own collections. Um, it's one of those tools, I guess, just to cover my back. I wouldn't ever run this across everything automatically. We've been running it in chunks over different data sets, so you can kind of check what information's being linked outwards. But it helps with that dodgy data cleaning, and it also helps with getting some of that magic and putting it out um, and putting the links in. The other, um, the other little tool it has in there is the ability to connect to uh, simple URL, URLs and APIs. And so we've just run a project to use the Digital New Zealand Concept API, which is a fantastic resource that has all of the uh, well, New Zealand-based artists um, and uh, creates a unique identifier for them and then creates links within the Digital New Zealand data sets. We're able to run all of our data against this and make those connections automatically for us. And then, of course, once we've made the connection, we are able to pull in birth dates, death dates, and spelling variations, and again, enrich our data. It was um, a really simple add-on. We just ran it overnight, and then we had sort of you know, 10,000 new links and new enriched data. It was, it was a, a wonderful, um, wonderful experience. So going back to those three questions, again, is it meant to be this difficult? No. There's tools we should be using. I feel a bit stupid I didn't. Um, and they're, they're really easy to use and they really make it uh, actually quite an enjoyable experience. I think we did the Auckland Museum mappings in, um, in the 3M system in like a day where we'd taken weeks um, to do it before. The magic, well, you're still going to have to do some work, but again, there are tools there that are going to help you create those outward links. Um, and can dodgy data be linked data? Well, just because your data is structured doesn't mean it's right. So you can still put it out there, but obviously, again, there's tools that are making this so simple to clean up and create, um, create uni unique identifiers for your content. But I guess the real question I went and asked people, because these are kind of cool questions, was, it's kind of, is it working? Is it worth it? I mean, we're putting all this effort into doing it. Is it something we should carry on doing? Um, and it, I, this was the question I'd ask the very last question, so they didn't hate me as I left. Um, and, and I always got a, a de I wouldn't be standing here if the answer wasn't yes, would it? Um, and so I got reminded while I was over uh, by the team at the British Museum, one billion websites, 60 trillion web pages, and 25% of them have some form of structured data. And by structured data, we're talking uh, just either schema.org, which is a really simple, broad ontology. Uh, we have unique identifiers. Many of the institutions in, uh, already in New Zealand are using unique identifiers. And so, and we, it's not new technology. We've been doing this for a long time now. And so we're slowly getting a critical mass of information that we can query over. The example that kept on coming up from outside the sector was the BBC and the BBC Things. Um, Again, they've been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, everything on the BBC website has a uh, unique identifier. Everything has one, uh, which means that every news article, sports reference, uh, recipe, TV show, radio show, magazine, all the information in there is made up of linked data, and you can find the connections between all of those different things. What's also impressive is that something like here, Auckland, they're including links outwards to other, uh, uh, other websites, such as GeoNames and DBpedia. And they're encouraging their staff to enrich those databases. So instead of just enriching their own little silo of data, they're enriching it for everyone to reuse and constantly updating. For the glam sector, back, still the BBC, um, this is the RES project, which is the Research Education S um, and uh, Space. 
and uh, this is a, a, a BBC project to link up um, uh, all of the, the large British organisations that are using linked data, the British Museum, the British Library, uh, the Wellcome Trust, the Science Museum, collate all of their data and then combine it and link it with the BBC archives uh, and then publish that as a tool that can go to educators. So what does this mean? Well, it means you can do a query as show me everything relating to you know, scene two, act one of Hamlet. And you're going to get all the references to that from the British Library, <laughs> as well as every time that scene has been played in a British uh, TV show or on the radio. And all of a sudden you get this huge wealth of information uh, and are able to provide that to the kids so that they can start exploring it. Um, it's a really sort of, uh, unfortunately it's, it's only in the UK, but it's a really great example of how we can combine multiple uh, sources, combine it with a sort of a third party, almost commercial um, partner, and then provide a really rich um, experience. Um, also, while I was in uh, the US, I met up with the guys from the American Art Collaborative, which is 14 museums, um, uh, including the Smithsonian, who have all agreed to release their data as linked data and again to work together to find the common connections between their collections. Um, it's again a fa it, you can see that we're starting to get built, we're starting to get a critical mass of people doing this and soon we'll be able to connect and really find the relationships. And again I'm just going to rattle off a few more web pages and uh, the Getty uh, as I mentioned before all of their vocabs available as linked open data and a really great starting point for um, uh, for most museums because we're probably already using something very similar. We're, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a project right now, six month project, to uh, clean up all of our place data and link to this. It means that we can now do queries such as show me all the objects that come from a town that's near a mountain. Um, and we, I don't know why you want to do that, but it means that we can pull that information, it's enriched. We didn't have to have that in our data because we're pulling all that geographic data from the Getty pulling it into our searches, enriching them, and able to do some really smart, um, smart queries over our data. And I think, um, last but not least, I think it's, it's really worth mentioning the Digital New Zealand concepts who have had a couple of times you've been mentioned today, I think, um, because it, it's just a great resource. And it's that move from an aggregator of just collecting lots of things to now making the connections and finding all of the connections that uh, exist within Digital New Zealand. We've been using it uh, to really enrich and improve our people, our person data set, and it's um, yeah, something that's just, just a fantastic resource. Everything these guys do is awesome, so good on you. Um, and the future, I guess, is sort of thinking what, you know, um, is, is it worth it? It's still a big question. I think really we need to remember that everything we do, everything we deal with is already linked. Our, our culture is already cross-linked. It's interdisciplinary, it's cross-institutional, it's multilingual. So it's already a network of information. It's a living, growing resource, and we shouldn't have to squeeze it into a predefined box of rows, tables, and columns. And at least uh, linked data as a technology allows it to exist as a network, as a graph that can grow and expand. It also allows us all to keep our own language and perspectives and worldview. But at the same time, we're harmonizing all of that data as a single integrated resource that we can now query over and, um, and reason over. Uh, but really, actually, this data harmonization and doing all this isn't just about um, making links to things. That's kind of just what we've got to do. Really, it's about exploring, discovering, and inferring new knowledge from our collections. I mean, interesting data has relationships, and the more of us that get on board and start doing this, the more, uh, the more powerful and the more interesting our data will become. And we can start to sort of, well, I like to think we can start breaking down the institutional silos that we've built up uh, and start finding the stories and narratives that weave between all of our collections. Um, yeah, we can start creating an environment for thought-provoking and engaging exploration. And I hope, at the end anyway, we'll be able to start asking the broader questions of our collections that are going to lead us to more interesting, more valuable, and I think hopefully more exciting results. Anywho, that's, that's me. Um, if you really want to nerd out with some questions, come on afterwards. <laughs> I'm happy to show all the tools. Please no, please no, please no. No, Adrian. <laughs> Hi, Adrian. <laughs>
Um, how do you sell something like this internally as a big piece of work? I think it's the, for us, we were able to take, we had 22 individual collection, well, collections, uh, each with their own standard and way of doing things. And so just internally, this has helped us map between all of those collections. We were able to, once we got all of that stuff into a data set, it was the first time we could kind of look down on everything. And we could say, actually, there's this field collector. We have his uniform, we have his diary, we have the collection he found, and we have his photographic stuff. And that was the first time we could actually do that. And so being able to get those really rich stories just from our own data, and then being able to say, well, now let's imagine if we had Tapapa's data and we had the Smithsonian's, we can really start uh, building those stories and those narratives. Um, but it's having the examples. And, I, and like I say, most people, I walk in and they say, oh, no, here, link data, here we go. But we can, uh, we can uh, being able to try and tell those stories is really, um, yeah, it gets people excited and then they start wanting to jump in themselves. Yeah. And Hello, anyone? Um, how do you like do the limiting? Because if you started linking up with all the museums is it on? Um, in the world, and someone does a search and gets overwhelmed with stuff, they're just going to turn off and say, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. How, how do you stop that happening? How do you stop like, the too large a search where people will just turn off, yes. do it once and, oh, get swamped? If the, the question is, if what happens when I guess when we have too much? Well, I guess if the search is too large, is that when the way the mappings work and the, ma the way that we're, the, the complexity of that network is you're really adding semantic data. You're encoding the meaning of your data in all of the, um, in the search values. So it means that when you're searching for Auckland, you're, you can search, are you talking about made in Auckland or born in Auckland or found in Auckland? And so you can start actually doing some really complex searches uh, on the meaning of the data instead of just doing a keyword search, Auckland. Is that kind of what you mean? Ish? No. So, with this stuff, say like you're getting locations, Dad, don't we have to agree on what, what, don't we have to agree on what Auckland is? And what if Getty doesn't have the same definition of Auckland we or more like a small <laughs> thing? Like, yep. does, does that mean we end up having globally, a global places database that everybody agrees on? or? That's the one thing I don't get. I can see the internal use. Sometimes. Yeah, we we had the um, uh, sort of the argument uh, about two weeks ago because the way the the Getty uh, defined something different between nation and country, and we couldn't dis and internally it was different to what we thought a a nation and a country would be. I guess in, in this case we're just accepting that that's the standard we're going to use, but I guess you can also do same as links, and so we've also uh, pulled in the Lins database and just being able to make as many connections as possible. We're not trying to just limit our focus on, on the Getty. But we, we had that argument, and in the end we just sort of said, we're just going to agree with the Getty, because they've already had the argument, obviously. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll agree with them. OK, I think we're out of time. So thanks, Adam. Thank you.